Thanks a lot, Martin, for this tour de horizon, this tour de force. Um, we've decided that we would try to um, start the Q and A uh, session with uh, two brief introductions or comments. One from Annika Sundain, who's chief economist of CEDA, and the second uh, from Tony Addison, who's chief economist and deputy director of WIDA. So, Annika, over to you. Thank you very much, Finn, and thank you very much for the invitation to come here today, and thank you very much for an interesting and very rich um, lecture, uh, Martin. Uh, I think it's clear from what we heard this afternoon that social protection is absolutely crucial for combating poverty and for, for redistribution, uh, and in particular in the, in the changing uh, of poverty. Uh, poverty today is much more about inequality, um, the distribution of resources rather than the absolute lack of resources. We also see a core of chronically poor people also for, for whom very little has happened, uh, also in countries uh, with rapid economic growth. So it's central in our eff efforts of, of leaving no one behind and as, as, as recognized by the SDGs. But I think it's also important to underscore how these programs, if they are well designed, are part of the social contract in a society and in that way are integral to nation building, democracy and social cohesion. If we look at developing countries today, they're expanding their, their social protections programs rapidly. Sub-Saharan Africa is just one example. And, and many donors, like CEDA, uh, are involved in, in these efforts. And, and Sweden supports programs in several countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. If, if this is gonna be successful, if these programs are gonna be successful long-term, however, country ownership, is, is absolutely crucial. It's the country itself that has to design and implement their programs. And there I think Professor Revalian makes a very important point, and that's the one about administrative capacity. We see that many of these programs are complicated, um, and we have to think about that when, when, when they are implemented. What type of programs can and should be implemented? And I think we, as donors, have reason to, to reflect here. If we then look at what kind of programs are are implemented, um, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is the conditional cash transfers that, we, that we've just heard about. Um, and they, they are modeled on the programs that were introduced uh, widely in Latin America in the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, these programs, as, and as research has shown, have been, have been successful in, in reducing poverty, at least in the short run. Uh, but going back to the, to the issue of, of country ownership, I think it's very, important to, to be careful when you take a model that's been successful in a certain context and then transplant it in, in, in another context. Um, you really have to think about the, the country where you are when you implement a social protection program. When, when you design these programs and, and think about the various components, I also think it's important to recognize that these are not just singular programs, but they really are systems. And that goes to the fact that they, they have to meet several objectives. It's about poverty alleviation, about protection. It's about protecting against risks that we all face during life, unemployment, sickness, disability, work injury, old age. And they have, ha they have to help build capacity for increased product productivity, health, and education. So the programs that we see expanding widely now, the cash transfer programs, I would argue is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, they build on the idea that they are, they are targeted and they should be temporary, albeit for a fairly long period of time, and it's only the poorest that should receive the benefits. And as, as Professor Valian clearly pointed out, there are a lot of problems with targeting. It's difficult, it's expensive, it's complicated, and it often misses the mark. Uh, I would, I would add another, another uh, argument to, to why, why we shouldn't focus so much on target, and, and it's, it's what, what, are the, what are the people, who, what are the characteristics of the people that, that these programs are aimed for? Uh, there are some groups that will never be able to support themselves through work. Children, the elderly, the disabled. These are also the people who are at risk for poverty uh, and are the target of, of the cash transfer program. So instead of thinking about designing the programs more, more or, or targeting them on income, 
I would say that given that these are the groups that are at risk for poverty, there is an argument for permanent social protection programs, such as social pensions and child allowances. Um, we heard that today's rich countries uh, appear to have done much better than today's poor countries um, to reach the poor when today's rich countries were, were poor. Uh, my hypothesis is that this is because universal programs were, were part of uh, policies when we went from being poor to rich. Sweden is a clear example of that. Uh, in the beginning of, of the 20th century, um, Sweden was one of the poorest countries in Europe. Uh, the first social protection program that was introduced here was a social pension in 1913. That, that was then followed by child allowances 30 years later, and then successively the programs were expanded. Programs that are targeted at the poor are all also easy to cut. Universal institutions that encompass a majority of the population tend to reduce levels of poverty and inequality much better because they don't have the exclusion prob problems and they have support by the middle class. But of course, if we look, and in particular if we look at if in Sub-Saharan Africa today, we know that tax bases are small and fiscal constraints uh, prohibit countries from introducing universal schemes. For example, looking at the young population in Africa today, it would be difficult to introduce universal child allowances. Social pensions could be, could be easier. So targeting may be a way to start, but if you are going to target on income or wealth, you have to make the construction simple and transparent. Not just because of administrative capability, but also because of it's much easier to understand. Simple targeting is a way for beneficiaries to understand why they receive the benefits and how much they receive. And it also makes, makes, paves the way for having a transparent and functioning grievance pro procedure. So you can complain, why didn't I get the benefits when I'm eligible? The second point that I want to talk about is, of course, the conditions in the, in the conditional cash transfer programs that they impose on households. If you, were, if you are to receive the transfer, you need to send your kids to school, you need to go to health checkups. Um, and, and as we heard in, in Latin America, this, is, this is had, have had success in, in health and education outcomes, at least in the short run. Uh, but here I would argue that policymakers try to solve problems that may originate somewhere else by imposing conditions on the poor. If you ask people living in poverty what they want, what do, you, what do you want for your children? The answer you will get is education. They want education for the children to be able to make a better lives for themselves. But in the countries uh, and the countries where CEDA work, uh, the obstacles are many. There are high fees to go to school, the schools are of poor quality, there are few schools and they are far away. So the question, if if these supply side problems will be fixed by imposing conditions on the poor. Uh, one argument is that if you do this, the poor could, could, could have a voice and it will put pressures on governments to expand health and education. Uh, but I think this is, is actually questionable given that people living in poverty almost always lack po power and voice. So I think instead social services need to be part of the social protection system uh, and ensure equal access. And that's much more efficient than imposing these conditions. Um, my final point is about the, the long-term perspective and that social protection really is long-term and that it takes time to build. Um, I said that you know, Sweden started with social pensions in, in the beginning of the 20th century. It took 60 years until our social protection program was fully expanded to what it is today. I also think it's crucial to think about the design of the programs and financing together. They go hand in hand. Tax revenues are necessary for these systems to be sustainable long term. And as countries expand social protection programs, they also need to expand their do domestic resource mobilization. They need to think about how they're going to finance these programs. The link between social protection, the link between the design of the program and the financing is also crucial because if you do that right, you can build a willingness to pay taxes and get, get, a, get, get something that's also sustainable. Uh, and of course, the link between the labor market and these 
programs are, are crucial to create incentives to work. Thank you. Um, well, this was a, a tremendous uh, tour de force by Martin. The, the first example that Martin gave us, the first um, empirical example from England, had uh, personally tremendous resonance for me because um, I come from the coal mining area of the north of England and uh, my ancestors, uh, the, the family history, the family legends, are all about actually moving in and out of poverty depending on the, the cycle in terms of coal production and uh, avoiding the workhouse in uh, Victorian um, England. And certainly there's a family legend of a, of a young woman um, having to go into the workhouse uh, in the early part of the 19th century uh, and actually being separated from um, the rest of her family because this is what the workhouses did to deter you and make sure that you didn't go into the workhouse unless you were in a very desperate uh, condition. There's also actually a family legend about um, another member of the family who tried to uh, uh, solve his poverty problem by stealing a sheep. And stealing a sheep in early 19th century England was a hanging offence. And he was convicted and he was hung. If he had uh, stolen a pocket handkerchief or something smaller, he'd have been uh, transported off to Australia, um, Martin's homeland. So in some ways, <laughs> this, uh, this sort of set of examples uh, you know, illustrates the, the kind of political dynamics around um, poverty, uh, the seeking of uh, control over poor people, but also, as Martin said, in the case of India, the expression of pe poor people's rights their, their right to demand a better future for themselves and for their children. But as Martin showed, it's, it's a very complex set of factors that you have to get together uh, to produce an effective social protection program. In some ways, we, we live at the most exciting time ever in terms of uh, poverty policy. As Martin said, we've never seen so many people move out of poverty. We still have deep poverty across the world, but we have lots of exciting new technologies, some of them coming from new technology itself, to replace the old mechanisms and old ways of doing things. So, for example, uh, the right to, sorry, the, uh, the make work programs, the public works programs that India has had for many years. Uh, Martin mentioned now the move over to uh, biometric identifiers, a precursor now to. Um, moving to more effective and cost-effective forms of, of financial transfer. One issue, of course, with, with public works programs is the quality of the infrastructure that's constructed, which is sometimes not of very good quality. Uh, a very good comparison might be, for example, with Ethiopia, uh, which Martin didn't have time to mention, where there's a, a very large public works program reaching now, I think, nearly 10 million people which has done a reasonable job in terms of creating infrastructure, uh, potentially better than that of India. But, you know, we've now got better ways and means to think about these issues. But it's still a difficult mix because there are, of course, there are all kinds of macroeconomic dimensions. Uh, the very macroeconomic shock that might make social protection essential to keep people out of poverty could be the same macroeconomic shock that reduces fiscal space, that reduces public revenues available for that social protection. Uh, clearly, as we move towards uh, basic pensions, more universal systems of social protection, it has to be within a macroeconomic framework that preserves those over time and sustains them. So these are really very, very big issues. Now, Martin uh, is very well known as um, an innovative quantitative economist, particularly in the use of household data and other data. And something that's very much come out for me in this lecture, but also in Martin's book, is the importance of data. And it might be nice during the discussion to have a little bit more um, sense about what kinds of data we do need in the world. Over 30 years, uh, we've seen much more data created particularly household-level data, uh, better measures of poverty. But I think none of us feel as researchers that we really have the data that we sufficiently need sometimes to inform policy. I have one, and here, this is the point at which I end, I have one question for Martin. 
And the question is, um, many young researchers are thinking about careers in economics. And if they want to go into economics, obviously one of the great areas they could go into is development economics, and they could go into the economics of poverty. So my question to Martin is, if you were recommending to a re young researcher now, what should they go out, what should they commit their future to doing, perhaps in the form of a PhD or some other piece of work, what would your recommendation be to that young person, that young man or woman going out from Stockholm to work in India or the Congo in terms of research impact, pieces of research that would really change policy for the better and for poor people? Thank you. <laughs> if I could invite Martin Anika to join Tony, and um, maybe I could um, just mention that I am deeply interested in that data point. Um, some of you may know that at WIDA we, we hold sort of two conferences a year, and we had worked quite a lot on developing a concept paper for a data for development conference uh, to be held in uh, September this year. Uh, and just two weeks before we were going to announce it, the World Bank came up and said, we're going to do the ABCDE conference this year in June on data for development. So there seems to be at least a shared concern about this. Uh, obviously, we, we were then changing, so we are now going to respond to crisis uh, in September instead. But the data point is a very valid one. Martin, do you have any sort of immediate reaction to Annika and uh, Tony? Well, I think it might be efficient to collect questions. I mean, um, I'm hoping there's lots sure. of uh, questions. Sure. Um, I'm going to start over mm -hmm. here uh, on the left-hand side. If you could sort of indicate if you want to intervene, have a question, and then sort of move over. Uh, please do introduce yourself uh, if you have any questions. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Gunnel Axelsson Nykander. I'm from Church of Sweden International Department working on development issues. Uh, I would echo very much of what Annika said about, especially about targeting and a more universal approach, and really saying as a uh, Scandinavian and Swede, listening to your arguments about uh, targeting and the downsides of that is quite, I mean, we all have it from, from growing up and, and the political debate and all about marginal effects, etc. And, and we know all from our personal life the, the benefits of inclusion systems. Um, however, we can see that it is the more, and you also reflect that, that it's the more targeted system that are now, um, not only in Latin America, but also in, in um, in Africa and Asia often promoted. Uh, and we can see that, at least up until now, I think it has been mostly DFID and the World Bank that has been promoting these kinds of, of programs, where many of the experts actually have the Anglo-Saxon wel welfare model in their DNA, to say. Whereas we can see that the experiences from the universal models, as we have in Scandinavia, hasn't been in that influential influential in, in um, uh, giving advice to developing countries. Um, of course, this is easy for us to say, yes, it's good for targeting. It's not as comfortable, maybe, for to say the same thing in the United States, because it inevitably goes back to your own society and your own system. Um, so my question would be, would you think it's possible for institutions like DFID and the World Bank to actually promote more universal models. Okay, thanks. Okay, here, yeah. please. <laughs> Mia. Thank you. My name is Mia Huna Brancian, and uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Center for Business and Policy Studies. Um, I, you said in the beginning of your talk uh, the need for adaptation of policy in relation to uh, evidence that comes from research and the type of evaluations of programs that you have described to us. I would like to ask, uh, the problem of adaptation of policies, what is the reason for, in, in your mind uh, behind that? Is it the fact that people are unaware of the research and the evidence? Uh, and uh, a lack of, of expertise in actually then adapting policies? 
or is it more maybe the type of questions or values and ideas about models or and uh, that is behind that you don't believe in the evidence so to speak or <laughs> or or kind of uh, have a higher high, higher type of uh, goal with your with your um, choice of a model okay I think um, here in the front with Tobion and then over here afterwards. Uh, first, Martin, thank you for your excellent presentation and, and overview. I think uh, this is a perfect place for this. This is a school and this was a fantastic lecture. So it's also an inspiration to all of the teachers uh, and students here. Uh, I, I have two questions, um, two different uh, issues. You mentioned political political economy a, a couple of times uh, in your talk, but I was wondering how you you think of these different programs in different political circumstances. I could see big differences in terms of how much of populism you, you may fall for as a politician under certain political regimes and, and how that may be different in others. So under what sort of political circumstances would you promote certain policies or, or avoid them? And I'm I'm thinking now in terms of also interest of CEDA and other donors, where should we push, push for these kind of programs? Under what political sort of umbrella should that be done? Um, the other one that I didn't really think you, you, you touched so much on, and, and I think it's also interesting, and I think uh, Annika was hinting at, at, at this, is the trade-off you mentioned here was, was sort of within the realm of, of, of having transfers, but really another trade-off is different items in the government's budget. And, and really, is this the most cost-efficient way over time to reduce poverty, or would sort of education or healthcare or something else mm -hmm. uh, be more relevant? And, and one of the issues here, I think it's extremely hard also when we now say we should evaluate things and see what works. Evaluating school reforms and poverty takes much longer than, than maybe evaluating some of these programs per se. So how, how do we actually figure out what is the most cost-effective way of, of reducing poverty? At the end? Thanks. Over here. And then I think we will pass over to Martin. Also, my name is John Joyce. I'm the Chief Economist at the Stockholm International Water Institute. Thank you, Martin, for a very innovative lecture. Uh, I want to pick up on Tony's point um, about data and picking up on what Martin said during his lecture on data not designed for purpose, measurement, errors, etc. And as an economist, we always like to use the quantitative side of things, but I'm just wondering how we've used qualitative data uh, from an ethnographic perspective and how much economists now need to start working more seriously on qualitative data in order to reduce uh, specification bias and misspecification, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, thanks. You want to take a, a turn, Martin, to uh, try and respond to sure. this? Sure. Um, these are all good comments, and I can't um, do, do justice to all of them. But um, uh, Annika's comment, really, I, I, I can't... Um, I like this, this way you talked about it, and, and um, I'm not sure, is that really how, how it happened? I mean, I know this, a little bit about the Swedish history, but, but if it was the case that, that, that the rich countries started with universal schemes and progressed to tar more targeted ones, it would be very nice for my argument. So <laughs> I like it, but I'm not, is that really, uh, has that got any external validity beyond Sweden? I'm, I'm not sure, but I've got to look into that. You know, because it, it nicely... It nicely emphasizes my point that currently all this emphasis on fine targeting in poor countries you know, is, is running against that historical process. And the historical process makes a lot of sense. Starting universal, and you develop capabilities, you get more finely targeted, and um, you don't overdo it because you've still got, it's still got to be politically sustainable. That would be a very nice story. But I, so I'm going to look into that. Um, I, I, I like the way of th you described it. It fits very well with how I think about it, I guess, but uh, I, I have to look into it. Um, data. Um, who, who was the point of... I didn't write down the... Who was talking about... Yeah, well, you, you, you're talking qualitative, but somebody else on data. I just can't... Well, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, right. Okay, it was Tony. Um, 
Well, two different, very different questions. I'll do them separately. So, Tony, um, and your two, your two questions. Um, yeah, we all know how important data is. I, I, I think there's two kinds of ways that data matter here. One is for doing the kinds of research and evaluation of what works and what's, what doesn't. And another is in how data is used in policy. Um, and I think I have to be careful about th those differences. Um, I see an enormously important role for high quality surveys, often tied to specific programs, building the, the capability for s uh, survey data collection in poor places. And I think that's happened in a big way. I mean, um, you hear, often hear this characterization that, that uh, socioeconomic data is poor in poor places, and probably that's true, but it is a bit exaggerated. I mean, you get some really good data in poor countries, but data for informing research and doing evaluation. When we start to take that data to, to social policy, then we get into a lot of trouble, because then we've got to extrapolate to much larger samples. Um, then I start to worry. I mean, this, this proxy means test that's so popular, I'm doing a, a study now for Africa where we're um, across every country you know, that we have data in Africa, we're just systematically going through to figure out under the ideal conditions, how well does a proxy means test really work? Now, f f in the audience, a proxy means test is exactly what it sounds like. You don't observe income. That's the data problem. So in the survey, do a good measurement of income. But when you go to scaling up to the policy, you've got to impute incomes in, under less than ideal circumstances for the purpose of implementing the policy. Right? And they're very different things. Uh, a proxy means test is, a, is an attempt to use a few a relatively small number of variables to predict somebody's income based on the correlates you found in the survey. But you take that, that model and you apply, scale it up to the country as a whole and you implement a policy. Even under excellent conditions on the survey, what you get in the end is really, sorry, is very, very poor indeed. Um, the, the inclusion-exclusion errors, are, it's horrible. I mean, in many countries, what we're finding, you've, it's just a little bit better than tossing a coin. Uh, if you really want to reach the undernourished uh, women and children as part of your anti-poverty policy, you know, this is not going to work. And part of the dissatisfaction with social policy, finally targeted social policy in poor countries, from the community perspective, is they see it. <laughs> they just see how badly it works. right? which is part of the motivation for this study, to really do a careful job of seeing how well it works. And I tell you, when I look at it, it doesn't look good. And we're basing our social policy in poor places on this technology. So very important distinction, the, the data you use for the surveys and the evaluation uh, versus how you scale up to the social policy based on correlates you find in that data. You can have a great survey, but the correlates are still so weak, uh, their information base for fine targeted programs is, is very poor, and you're not going to reach the groups that you, you, you want to reach as effectively as you might like. Um, it's very subjective, though. You know, another little observation. Um, two people can look at the same thing. I see this repeatedly and come to different conclusions. It, toward late in this study that we're doing in Africa, we haven't written anything yet, but we've been massive number crunching. Um, late in the study, I started looking at what people who defend proxy means testing, which once included me, by the way, I mean, until I started really looking at it seriously. Um, uh, I look at uh, what the arguments they make, and, and they occasionally do something quite similar to what I'm doing, and they look at it and say, oh, look how good it is. And I look at it and say, look how bad it is. And it's the same thing. Is the glass uh, half full or half empty? There is, it's perception, but, but obviously people are defending it. This technology is, is taking over. You're seeing it all over the world now, in, in developing countries, this proxy means test technology. And I really worry if that, that, that's going to be able to deliver. Again, back to the point that... Um, you may be much better off with a universal program. And, and somebody raised these, the really important issue of funding these programs, I think it was Annika. Um, remember, what I was doing with that NREG, I'm taking the budget of NREG. They've already got a budget. I'm taking that and I'm allocating it uniformly. I'm not spending more money than they've already decided to spend. I don't think they're spending enough. <laughs> That's another point. 
right? And that goes back to the very important point that was raised by, I think, um, Professor Becker, your second comment, I think. Items on the budget, the trade-offs between um, things. You know, this is really neglected. And it's silos. If you look at this, they've got social protection silos, we've got uh, human uh, development silos, education. They've got worse and worse as in the sense that they're not communicating with each other. And very few people in development now are asking those questions about the trade-offs. Should we be building bridges or should we be building schools? And we're not informing, we're not telling countries about that. They, they, they want to know that this, the answer to your question as well. But we, we can't tell them. We, because our research is in these silos, and this is a really big problem. Um, I'm not seeing enough of that kind of broad cross-sectoral work. And that's one of the many recommendations I'd give back to Tony's second question. Re many recommendations I'd give to PhD students. Those, those bigger trade-offs between the, the, the line ministries, if you like. And it's, it's part of the politics of it. When we deal with countries, we deal specifically with the ministry. You know, and we're, we're tied to that ministry. Um, we used to have the cap much more capability, I think, for the cross-ministerial debates and discussions than we have today. Uh, sadly, I think the old planning commissions, the legacy of the sort of control economies that were common in, 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 um, in developing countries, well, you know, the, the control economy was pretty much a mistake. <laughs> We know that. Market-driven economies are much better at producing growth and all of that, fine. Um, I think that's pretty well established. But the planning ministries all got axed, with, one, with very few exceptions. Some stayed, but they were doing different things. Um, we, didn't, we, 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 gave, we, we threw the baby out of the bathwater. <laughs> you know, the baby was the, the capability for making those broad cross-sectoral prioritizations in public finance. I think we've got diminished capability in that area. These silos have not helped. Um, other questions. The, um, um, how to get more universal programs. This is um, uh, the person from Church of Sweden. Um, the very first question. Um, you know, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this Anglo-Saxon versus Scandinavian model characterization, but okay, that's not a big issue. I can live with that. I'm on the Anglo-Saxon side, but I'm, I'm thinking... I don't think that... And it certainly wasn't just Scandinavians or Nor Nor Nordics or whatever who were talking about this. This <coughs> goes, goes way, way back. Um, certainly lots of discussion of this in the 18th century. There was... You know, um, anyway, there's a lot I could say there, but that's more history of thought stuff. On your, the more, much more important question, how do we get... World Bank and DFID, well, I think DFID has pretty much been following the bank on this. Um, how do we get them to talk about the sco scope for universality? Well, by, by me and, and you and discussing, having discussions like this. Um, you know, I, I've tried for 24 years to get uh, the bank and the fund to, to think differently about targeting, and I, and I will acknowledge it was one of my greatest failures. It's so embedded. You know, target the thing. Finally, this word targeted. You'll do any. You know, sure, spend money on poor people, but target it really well. Uh, in situations where you don't have the capability to do that credibly, uh, it's really you. 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 Just and and, and it's, in the end, it's poor people who, who are not getting the benefits and the, the help they should be getting, because in the end, you have to judge it by impacts on poverty, not by targeting. Um, it's a mantra that has been very hard. People will, you know, smart people will obviously recognize my arguments and, and agree. But it's become, and, and in fact, again, the silo of social protection, um, in the industry of social protection, has not helped either. Um, so I, I don't have an answer to that. I, I think we just got to keep that, that's, that thing I keep saying that targeting is not the objective. <laughs> Is poverty reduction. Now we can debate about what that means, but I think we've got a, we, we've got a pretty clear idea, and we can talk about specifics. But um, keep your eye on the objective in, in terms of people's welfare and how you get there. And the more we can emphasise that, the better. Um, what have I left out? Um, oh, Mia's comments on the. Um, 
I think a lot of it is, is the politics of capture and bureaucratic inertia. I think it's the main reason we don't see more adaptation to inform evidence, that in programs become embedded and they have a, a, a lobby group in the government and they have a constituency and they're fighting for keep their program all the time and we see that repeatedly and that's not, not, a, that's not just a problem of developing countries. <laughs> you know, everywhere we see that. And, and that kind of um, entrenched uh, support and a bureaucratic inertia and protection of the, your favourite program is the main reason, I think. And we just have to call that out. You know? and, now, a lot of this, as a researcher, I always think what I'm doing and other researchers are doing is really doing just that, calling it out, <laughs> you know, informing a public debate with evidence to try to move it on a bit. And that's really the, the, the main um, point of my lecture. On the, the John's point about the qualitative data, um, I, I'm, I've never ever thought you could only study poverty and inform anti-poverty policy with qualitative data. I find it very limiting. But equally well, I've never thought, I've, well that's an exaggeration, I probably once thought you could do it with only quantitative data, but I've now come to the view you need both. Yeah? But you don't need it in the way it's, it's often used. I mean, I'm a big fan of doing qualitative work after quantitative work. Yeah? Um, not before or in parallel with. Um, so I'd really like to see more economists doing this. This basically means do your quantitative work. Every time, every every study I've, I've done, almost every one, I've had puzzles. You know what we do in economics and empirical research is very black box like. We we have these black boxes. You know we can't see inside them with our tools. The worst case, of course, the randomized control trial is it's a complete black box about how you got the outcomes that you got. Um, but, but everything, it's not just a problem with RCTs. I mean, a lot of what we do in economics is very, not, very, uh, it's not very revealing about the processes. Empirical economics is not very revealing about the processes that generate impacts. And I find actually talking to people, I, I, don't, I think I'm, I'm much better at quantitative work than qualitative work, and I always try to get people who have the reverse comparative advantages to work with me. But um, I think you can learn a lot about processes of how things actually happen by talking to people <laughs> yeah. um, and subducing subjective data in intelligent ways as well. Recognize it's subjective, but, but uh, you can still learn from it. I think, I, have I left anybody out? I think I've covered no, most of the pretty, questions. That was pretty all array. Other questions? Yeah, please, here in the center and then here. Um, my name is Odi, um, I'm a PhD student uh, from South Africa. So, um, China has been quite successful in, in, uh, in reducing poverty, and I think the, the num if you look at the numbers, the, the global numbers, a big chunk of that is coming from China. Can, can we attribute all of that to growth, and, and, and if not, what can, how much can we attribute to, gro to growth, and, and, and where do we attribute the rest? Okay, here in the front. My name is Rutger Parmesan. I'm a former uh, diplomat and a former banker, uh, originally a sinologist. Uh, my question, uh, in my question, I want to introduce another kind of silo. Uh, that is uh, the silos we see uh, dominating uh, the uh, many countries in uh, the emerging markets, uh, and I'm thinking of uh, traditional uh, structure, social structures like clans, castes, and so on. Uh, the Indian caste system you could uh, call an uh, infl inflationary rigidity in the Indian labor market. Uh, and my question is, uh, since these uh, social structures frequently uh, seem to operate as uh, poverty traps, how do you eliminate uh, poverty in countries where uh, the strength of the social structures exceed that of the state. Possibly looking at uh, the uh, fiscal revenue relative to GDP. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay, here over the back. Um, 
Can, ah, sorry. Can I put a question? No, sure, yeah. absolutely. No, please go. Um, and then we'll take the other one afterwards. Thank you for a, a very interesting lecture. My name is Christina. Uh, I'm from the trade unions. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, in the, in the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned the fact that rich countries of today were better at targeting the poor uh, when they were poor. And it would be interesting if you could elaborate on that and explain wh why. Why was that? Uh, the second question is the um, the factor of uh, a weakening uh, bargaining power of the trade unions and the lower level of union unionization in the world right now, and how that would affect the the uh, possibilities uh, of protection and, and promotion. Uh, and in many, some countries, uh, like in Sweden, it is actually the the, uh, the two-part model that sets many of the protection and promotion policies. Um, so how would you see that? Thank you. Thanks. And then up here in the back. Thank you, Professor uh, Ravalion. Uh, my name is Damir. I'm an economist working at Stockholm Peace Research Institute. Uh, the question goes uh, partly to your case studies when you mentioned in China case that knowledge uh, through the movie you provided didn't really transfer to action. So the question is, what helps to move people from being knowledgeable, being informed, changed attitudes, and moving to action, change in behavior? Okay. Thank you. I think we will pass over to you, Martin, and then um, Tony and Annika, if you have any um, okay, the, I'll try to go in order this time rather than chopping around. The, the South African PhD student. Um, okay, so there's two levels of answer to your question. Um, first is a kind of um, almost a mathematical level. You can think of a change in poverty as determined by uh, growth in part and changes in distribution. Okay? Um, in a narrow sense, all of China's poverty reduction has been due to growth rather than changes in distribution because distribution's got worse. Relative distribution, relative inequality in China has been on a trend increase over 30, 40 years. Um, not, not, not sort of all the time increasing, not monotonic as we say, but, but um, some periods falling, other periods, but you know, the trend upward has been dramatic. Um, in fact, um, if you just extrapolate the trend in China's inequality uh, back uh, over the last 30 years, you know, you, it's going to be the same inequality of Brazil within uh, in 10 years. Uh, but I don't think that'll happen. And I actually think it's topped out. I, I don't think it's, there will be there are limits because there's changes in the Chinese economy, particularly coming from the absorption of rural labor. Um, China started from a situation of Massive, it's, it's a classic uh, Lewis model. We had massive uh, labor surpluses, wage rates were no, no upward pressure on wage rates for a long period. That upward pressure is now emerging. Wage rates are rising at the low end in China. Uh, capital is actually starting to ex leave China, looking for lower wages elsewhere. Uh, and that's a very good process. That's, that's great good news because real wages of poor people who were poor are rising, and that's great. Um, Going forward, I think that'll put a, there are other things that are involved too, but that's one of the big economic changes that's going to um, put a break on, the ri on rising inequality. But there are other forces that are working in the opposite direction, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. That's the easy answer, <laughs> right? Now they go to go deeper, right? And when you go deeper, it, it gets more complicated. I, I'd point to a number of things that were really crucial. So, then, then you've got to ask, well, why, what determined the growth? What determined the inequality? What, what was going on? What's under the surface? Um, there are a number of things. Um, I actually think the sequencing of economic reform. China's one of the few developing countries that maybe you got that sequence roughly right. It started with agriculture and rural development, moved on to a basic industry. It moved up a kind of a sensible ladder in its policies. This is a highly interventionist economy. This is amongst developing economies with high, with with a lot of administrative capability. Um, 
they can do a lot. <laughs> um, they can also make big mistakes, as they often have, and, the, and, the, and the, some of the greatest mistakes in human history, the, um, like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. But, but um, when you when you the sequencing of reform from Deng Xiaoping's initial impetus for reform in 1978, focused initially on agriculture and rural development and stayed with that for until mid to late 80s and, and then started to move on to industry. And that sequencing was roughly right. I actually think they moved on too quickly. I think they could have had an even more dramatic poverty reduction and it is astonishing what happened. The absolute poverty reduction is, is, is the fastest and great, largest in terms of the sheer numbers that we've ever seen. Um, could have uh, could have done better with the, if it uh, if it had um, stayed with with our, there's a lot a lot of the agriculture and rural agenda and the grand reform agenda was left undone um, by the time the industrialization push uh, the TVEs the um, uh, manufa export led manufacturing growth by the fi by the time that started to take over in the trajectory for poverty reduction well the, the bulk of the work is still was done by rural poverty reduction in in China. Um, another aspect that they got right, I think, um, which was very, is a very important lesson. The, the first is an important lesson for Sub-Saharan Africa because very few countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have got that sequencing right. They've tried to, they've gone straight for industry, they've, uh, they've neglected agriculture, and, and that's been to their peril and that has not helped their poor, the poor. So, the second thing is, is evidence-based policy making. We don't think of it, and actually the politics was driving the first as well, but it's the second especially. The politics here was that you had a potential food crisis in, in, in China in the late 1970s that they really had to address, a food security problem. It was massive. But the, the second really important thing was in the sequence, it was in the, the way they learnt, the way they tailored their sequencing of reform and the specific reforms to evidence. Now, Deng Xiaoping again, uh, he said, um, seeking truth from facts. That was a political reaction to the Cultural Revolution, to ideological based policy making. And, the and, and it was so important. Uh, they didn't have the tools <laughs> to do good evidence based policy making yet, but they had the culture of evidence based policy making as a reaction to, to Mao, essentially. Um, and that was really important. So you saw all the time they were looking, experimenting. The program I talked about today, the Dibao program, that emerged out of an experiment in Shanghai. Uh, they they try and and there are all these experiments going on all over China. There still are, and they're looking at them and learning. And oh, that seems to work. Let's do that. Yeah. When I look at the quality of their evidence, you certainly don't see randomized control trials, but. Well, you know, maybe now, but 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 um, the, the quality is is not always <laughs> there, but the culture is there, and that's really important, and that's another lesson for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so there are there are deeper deeper answers to your question. There are other things I could say, but I think that's that was a, a start. Um, the question about silos, social structures. This is really hard, um, and the caste system in India, particularly, has been just so hard to change. It's, um, I, don't, I don't have an answer. I, 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 I see it all the time. The, now, all the time we're worried about social exclusion. We're worried about social exclusion in everywhere from, from Bihar through to Brussels. And, and we're seeing it all the time. You know? And this is partly why I emphasize the importance of thinking about relative poverty as well as absolute poverty. So you've got to look at both. And that's really about the concept that sociologists have, and uh, people like going back to people like Peter Townsend in Britain. Social exclusion is, is hugely important as a concept, in my view. Um, I, I, I have, there are debates about that. Some economists are not so fond of the idea, but I, I, I like it. Um, and I can't, it gives me a way of understanding uh, a lot of problems. And the um, lack of inclusion associated with the rigidities in India's labour market associated with the caste system is, is just. Um, Horrible. It's horrible for the information transmission, for learning about public programs, not as well as for the labour market. Um, I don't have any simple answers. Uh, you know, the, India's been f officially been fighting the caste system since uh, India has been a country. <laughs> I mean, since it's been an, since independence, 1947, that the struggle's been going on. To, uh, but it's it's still there. 
It's alive and well. What do you do? I don't know. Um, there's a nice topic to add to the really tough questions that uh, Tony would like to give PhD students. And I, I, it, needs, it needs a lot of focusing, though, before you can turn it into a researchable question. But certainly we have lots of research on the implications of caste and clan social structures, the costs of those, the economic costs of those, and, and the, the costs for effective policy making as well. But in terms of research on how to change it, I don't know. Um, Christina's question, uh, rich countries, I think the answer, rich countries doing better at targeting when they were, when they were poor, I, I think the, the answer goes very much to the previous discussion about universality, but I, I put that out as a hypothesis that, where was, the, where was Christina? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, I put that out as more uh, an hypothesis that um, rich countries were, were more successful in social policy early on because they, they better tailored what they did to the capabilities they had administratively and politically. And, and the constraints they face politically, but that's 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 my contention. Yeah, but I can't prove it. But I think that that was important. Um, I think the decline of unionization is a big concern. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sort of I I, I, I worry a lot about um, internal labour markets. I worry about dual labour markets. I worry about the problems of labour market rigidity. I don't think there's a, a hell of a lot we can always do about that. But I think making, the, I can see the potential for uh, gains to poor people from uh, making labour markets work more effectively. But I don't think unions need to be against that. So I think a, a lot of the, if the union movement was more sympathetic with the arguments that people like me make about uh, labour market flexibility and the, and the scope for poverty reduction, we could make more progress. But um, labour movement has, has been, a, um, by and large, a hugely important progressive force in the history of fighting against poverty, but not always. And we should recognise that too. Um, and the point about labour market flexibility is one example. Um, you know, I think um, I can give you others too. But by and large, my answer is that yes, it's, it's, a, it's a, a big concern. And I think it will make it harder, probably, to achieve the kind of uh, social consensus that we need, particularly around, I mean, I think we have a social consensus around poverty reduction. I don't think we have anywhere now a social consensus around inequality reduction. We just have continuing debate. And I think um, the labor movement in what's left of it in the United States could be hugely important here. But um, you know, that, that achieving that social consensus will be about a lot more than that. It will be about trying to unpack this concept of inequality, trying to make the... It's, like, it's what Barack Obama asked his, a bunch of people who were invited to the White House uh, last year, and, and he asked them, them uh, you know, people working on US uh, inequality, and he asked them, um, how do I talk about inequality in America without being accused of, accused of class warfare, of, of instigating class warfare? And that's a hugely important question. How do we get, how do we get that discussion about inequality to be much more focused on the costs of inequality, much more focused on what aspects of inequality are really damaging? A generalised discussion is just not going to get the social consensus. And I, but I think um, the labour movement could be very important part of that. Um, Damien's question on the um, from the. From the uh, I said, well, just a little clarification. The movie was about India, not China, but that's not important. Um, and the lesson was that there are two, th two things are broken, right? People's knowledge about their rights. Poor people don't know what is due to them. And the, 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 the public sector is not responsive to their needs. And that both things come together to mean they don't get what they're entitled to. And that's poor service delivery, which we see all the time. Service delivery to poor people is generally poor. right? And it's the combination of their lack of knowledge and the lack of a responsive supply side. <laughs> but the two are kind of working together. You know, The lack of knowledge is often part of the reason why the supply side is unresponsive. Local leaders don't share information because it reduces their power. They have all kinds of rents that they get out of that process. So it's all kind of, it's like a knot 
and you've got to cut it somewhere to unravel it. And what this study at the movie did is, is tell me, this is the, point, the whole point of it, was to see whether just changing knowledge would make better service delivery. Is it just about telling people their rights under the law and to, to so they know? And the answer is no, it isn't. That the supply side also needs to change. So, so the knot is not unraveled that way. You're going to have to have both. They're going to have to know what, they, what is due to them, what the, and, and, then, and the supply side has got to be more effective in delivering it. Okay. Annika, Tony, any? Just one last um, question, Martin. In, in, in your, all the work that you've done and all the countries that you've visited, what has most surprised you? for good or bad? What has most surprised me? Annika? Any other additional last question? No, no, I was just thinking about the point about looking at it as systems, and if you can elaborate. Yeah. Because I think one, one, another reason why Sweden has been, been successful transforming from poor to rich was that, that during that period we saw it as a system, and having protection programs that also supported labor force participation and you know enabling both mm -hmm. women and men in work by introducing subsidized childcare and so on. I mean, it took, it took yeah. some time, but, but I mean, really thinking about it as yeah. getting people onto the labor market. So any Ma thoughts on mm -hmm. that? Martin? Um, well, again, interesting thought, but I, I don't have any, any comment. Um, and more than what I've said. Uh, su what, what surprised me the most? Oh, goodness, let me think. Oh, um, Going back, um, something you never would have expected that theoretical economics would not have predicted that. Uh, uh, oh goodness! Well, um, are there no surprises in the world? Uh, yeah, there's so lots and lots, but I'm, I'm looking for the, the number one surprise. Uh, yeah, you you asked me not not did anything surprise you? <laughs> yes, much harder question. What was the most surprising thing? Um, the time. Because uh, I spent a lot of time comparing China and India, mm -hmm. and my prior, I, I started in India, obviously, and I've been working in India for 35 years. But um, I came to China in the early 1990s, and um, and, and in, in India, there was a lot of focus on China. You know, people are really very interested in China, and you get a discussion all the time. So, and I was going to China as more sort of. Somebody, you know, um, I don't think I'm, I could ever be an honorary Indian citizen, but I'd love to think of myself like that a bit, and um, as somebody coming from an Indian perspective. And China was a big surprise. Um, I was surprised at the administrative capability. I was surprised at the, but more subtly, I was surprised at the capability to get things wrong too. Um, and I would ask myself. If I was reborn in, in kind of Hindu style, uh, as reborn as a poor person in a village in India or a poor person in a village in China, which would it be? And after about the first few trips in China and working in the fields in southwest China and um, Sanxi and the lowest plateau region, I was pretty convinced that the answer is China. And why? This is the most, I guess, the number one surprise because I'd be freer. Here we've got a country that's not a democracy. India is a democracy, the largest democracy in the world. And yet I'm saying that if I was poor, in a, a reborn poor in an Indi Indian village versus a Chinese village, I'd rather be in the Chinese village because I'd be freer. Because I saw poor people in Chinese villages who did stand up for their rights. Mm -hmm. And when they were trampled on, they would, they would fight. They had a, you know, they, you couldn't do to them what I saw being done <laughs> to poor people in, in Indian villages. Mm. So that, I guess, number one surprise, that when you think about freedom and democracy, there's many levels of it. You know? uh, sure, uh, you know, China is not a democracy at the, the highest level of that term, but there are, are more subtle and finer grained interpretations of what that means. Mm. Okay. I said in my opening remarks that uh, Martin is a global leader in the field of poverty analysis. 
I certainly think we got that demonstrated today, both in breadth and in terms of depth. I'd like to say thank you very much, Martin, for a magnificent wider annual lecture. I'd like also to say thank you very much to SITE for collaboration and to CEDA for support. And I'd like to thank for the uh, engagement in the lecture. Um, you're all invited to a reception outside where the discussion can continue and you can engage on the questions that you did not ask. But I would like to ask you to join me in a big applause for Martin. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you.